Will there be a Northern Hemisphere version of Vera Rubin? Or maybe we could put one in space. Can Vera Rubin detect alien spacecraft if they ever visit? And if it finds Planet Nine, how quickly will we be sending a mission there? And in Q&A Plus, how many planets will be out there if we reinstate Pluto as a planet? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Richard G. Vera Rubin found approximately 2,000 new asteroids in its first look. With over a million asteroids already known, how do astronomers track them all and ensure new discoveries aren't duplicates? Right, so they go to a place called the Minor Planet Center. And this is a website. And whenever you discover new asteroids, you have to calculate the orbit of the asteroid. And so you have to watch them for multiple nights to be able to see how far away from the sun are they? What is their orbit? You can track an orbit. There's six variables that you use. And I forget what they all are, but they're like the eccentricity and the ascending node and the descending node. So you can take any object. And when you do enough observations of that object, you can calculate its orbit. And then once you've calculated its orbit and its current position, then you go and you register that. You do a check with the Minor Planet Center to see if that object is already in their database. And you can register it with the Minor Planet Center. And then other astronomers will do follow on observations to double check the observations that you've made of that asteroid. So, you know, even though space is really big and there are a lot of objects, each individual object is going to have its own orbit and that orbit is going to have, it's like a fingerprint. And so, you know, every time you discover an object, you can just quickly calculate all the ephemeris and then you can compare them against existing ephemeris and then you will know which are new asteroids and which are already known asteroids. Rod Tolosa 4594, will Vera Rubin detect alien spacecraft? Vera Rubin could detect alien spacecraft. It is probably the best chance to detect alien spacecraft. When you think about how much of a problem satellites are going to be for Vera Rubin, that's because you're going to have spacecraft that are reflecting light that are passing through the field of view, and it's going to be able to detect a lot of them. But also it can detect all of these asteroids, right? It's going to find 4 million asteroids during its 10-year operations. So if there are spacecraft that are moving through space around us and they are reflecting light, or they are emitting light, and it is within the capability, the brightness that Vera Rubin is able to see, then it should theoretically be able to see them. So yeah, I think, you know, if any kind of UFO or, you know, alien space fleet here in the solar system was found, Vera Rubin would probably be the spacecraft that found them. Beyond that, it would then be probably Nancy Grace Roman. But yeah, Vera Rubin for the win. E. Strom, are there plans for a telescope equivalent to the Vera Rubin Observatory for observations from somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, like the Canary Islands or Hawaii? Now, I asked the director of Vera Rubin, Dr. Edward Ajar, this very exact question. And, you know, the answer is the obvious one, which is like, it would be awesome to have another version of Vera Rubin in the Northern Hemisphere. But the challenge is you only have budget for one. You know, it was a billion dollars. They only could make one, so they made it. And, and the best place to put it was the Southern Hemisphere. So that's where they put it. And that'll get you about 70% of the sky. So you're still missing about 30% of the sky that you just can't see from, from that part of Chile. Would it be great to have a version of it in the north? Absolutely. You know, there are lots of telescopes that, you know, I think about the, say, the Gemini north and south. So the Gemini north is in Hawaii, the Gemini south is in Chile, and the two work, you know, together to look at various objects and sort of, you know, we have these twin telescopes. And you can imagine a version of Vera Rubin in the north that's doing the exact same thing and it's completing that observation of the sky. Where would you put it? Yeah, you put it in Hawaii which would be ideal. But obviously, you know, we've saw, seen a lot of challenges to putting large observatories in Hawaii. So your second best place is the Canary Islands. And it's still pretty good. It's not quite as good as the Hawaii, but it, you know, it, it will do. And so that's the and, the, and the, the Canary Islanders are super ecstatic to have a big observatory installed. So I think that's the place you're going to see this is um, you're going to see probably the 30 meter telescope go to the Grand Canary Islands if it ever gets built. And you're probably going to see the you know, Vera Rubin North go to the Canary Islands. But 
you know, there's a lot of learning that needs to be done. And so the whole point of building the first fear Ruben, you know, you had to build the big telescope, build big mirror, get all of the operations working, make sure it all works. And then you learn all of your lessons and then you build the next version and that will be the partner in the North. But, you know, wait for another maybe 10 years and they'll start building that version or never. Who knows? You know, it depends on how much funding there is for science. Skygunner777, how much would it cost to put the equivalent or greater version of Vera Rubin in space, even if it took multiple missions to build? You could probably do it as a single spacecraft, right? It would just, you know, once you're out in space, then you can observe the sky more quickly. You don't have to deal with the atmosphere. And Nancy Grace Roman is pretty close to that. You know, it has a very wide field of view. It's an infrared telescope. It's not performing a survey in the same way, but it is doing a large scale survey of the universe. So it would absolutely be possible to create some version of Vera Rubin. Uh, you know, could you have a car, something that that is the size of a car as your camera? Yeah, theoretically, like maybe when Starship flies, it could or, or New Glenn could carry something like the space Vera Rubin telescope. And it would be amazing, right? Like maybe it would be and it would be able to see the entire sky it wouldn't be limited to just the southern hemisphere it could see the entire sky. So, you know, the maybe Vera Rubin is a pathfinder to a future space based Vera Rubin, like all of these ideas, all of these missions that we all want, we don't get to have them because we spend money on the military, that we spend money on all kinds of things that humanity spends money on, which you may consider to be of a lower priority than really cool space, but the rest of humanity doesn't see it that way. So we're in this kind of funny place that, you know, maybe 5% of most countries gross domestic product is spent on research. Um, and some may spend a little more and some spend a little less. And the nations that have done the best are the ones that have spent more, you know, over the long, you know, that because it accumulates, right? The knowledge accumulates over decades, over hundreds of years. And the US is the best example of this, right? They were for the longest time, the greatest spenders on science, and they are the largest economy in the world. And a big part of that comes from a lot of people, but also that they invested in science and technology. And yet we're seeing a decrease in budgets right now, which is unfortunate because that means that a lot of this kind of stuff, like you wouldn't get a Vera Rubin in the future uh, if, you know, under the current decreasing budgets. So I don't know what the answer is. I just, you know, whenever I sort of people are like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had it? Yes, it would be cool if we had that. But right now, unfortunately, we're not even going to have the stuff that we were supposed to have. Not to mention the cool ideas that would take us to Enceladus and uh, under the ice on Europa and to launch a telescope that allows to directly observe habitable exoplanets. But I digress. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Demetheus Jackson, Leon, Sean Osnes, Asa, Dave Shia, Shane Larkin, Jim Van Nostrand, Vinnie Rafter, Kevin McLeod, and Joel Bernerman. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Nigel Dawson, how do they keep these massive telescope lenses clean? Or does that affect the images too much? So we learned about this with Vera Rubin and all the other telescope facilities is that they have a facility to resurface the telescopes. So over time, the telescopes do get a layer of dust, they get, you know, little bits of soot and dust gets onto the telescope lens and they can repolish it. But what they can also do is resurface it, recode it. So they take the telescope, they actually have a facility right where Vera Rubin is, and they can unmount the entire primary tertiary mirror, take it into this facility, polish off all of the material on it, and then put a new silver surface back onto it and then bring that back out and put it back up. And so whenever the, you know, they're watching the optical quality of the telescope all the time. And whenever it drops below some certain amount, they will fix it and resurface it and then bring it back out. And this kind of facility is available to all of the telescope, the large telescopes. Austin App, if Planet Nine exists, is it possible that it would be geologically active or would it be too cold? So it depends on the size. 
Uh, but it, the assumption is that Planet Nine is going to be big, like it's going to be Earth sized big or maybe even Neptune sized big, but farther out, it's going to be a big object. And so if it is like Neptune sized, then it's going to be like an ice giant. So it's going to be very similar to Uranus and, and Neptune, that it's going to have things that are like ices and volatiles. You know, it's kind of like a like a rocky core surrounded by a slush of water ices and different kinds of volatiles. And then it's going to have an atmosphere that is like ammonia and methane. Um, so it'll be like that. And so is that geologically active? No. But if it was a planet like the Earth, Earth sized, then it would be cooling down. It would, it would still be very icy. It probably, you know, wouldn't have a lot of rock inside of it. And so whatever it was, it would be like a very large Enceladus or a very large Europa. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't be in orbit around something. So it wouldn't have the same tidal activity. But chances are, you know, if it's that big, then it's still going to have some residual heat internally from its formation, from whatever radioactive decay is going on internally. And so that is probably going to make its way out to the surface in some way. Uh, so you could see cracks on the surface. You could see places where there's cryovolcanism on the surface. And it's kind of amazing how active even Pluto is. Pluto has glaciers of the kinds of things that you would consider to be atmosphere around other worlds. And yet Pluto has them just move around its surface as glaciers. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, once we actually find it, it's going to be really exciting. like, hmm. Like, I realize that I don't really spend a lot of time thinking, kind of imagining what Planet Nine would be. What would it be like? And... And I think, you know, as Vera Rubin is coming online, and that's going to be one of the objects that it hopefully will find, that now we start to wonder, like, what is this thing going to look like? How would we study? Will we send a spacecraft out to do a flyby of it? Uh, it's pretty exciting times. Casey Ream, would we be able to launch a mission to Planet Nine? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, we could launch a mission to Oumuamua, which is a, a interstellar object that is zipping out of the solar system on an interstellar trajectory, and it's not coming back. We could chase that object down if we had the will. Flying out to planet nine, let, let's say it's 200 astronomical units away, 500 astronomical units away, we could build a spacecraft that could do that. And in fact, it's the same kind of challenge that we would need to do to be able to go out to the solar gravitational lens, which is at 550 astronomical units. So what if we launched a mission that we found a planet, like when we find planet nine, then we find a extrasolar planet that's on the other side of the sun from where planet nine is going to be when our spacecraft gets out there. And then we send the solar gravitational lens observatory out. It does a flyby of planet nine and then turns back and uses the solar gravitational lens to observe a distant exoplanet. That'd be a twofer. So yeah, absolutely. It just requires new kinds of propulsion technology, requires budget funding, and requires the will over multiple administrations or multiple countries working together to be able to pull this off. But it won't be cheap. It'll be expensive. But you look at something like, say, New Horizons. New Horizons was a relatively inexpensive mission compared to larger flagship missions. And in 10 years, it got all the way out to Pluto and gave us the first close up images of Pluto and then took pictures of another Kuiper Belt object. So these things are possible. It's just, you know, right now, NASA is having to cancel the Mars sample return mission, which is like the top priority of the scientific community that's getting canceled. So going out and visiting planet nine is lower. Like we haven't gone back to Uranus or Neptune. So there's a long list of things to do before someone says, okay, let's send a mission out to Planet Nine. But you're, I guarantee the moment Planet Nine is discovered, somebody is going to start figuring out what a mission to Planet Nine would look like. I'll bet you there's even a paper right now. Like we just covered a paper on Universe Today about sending a mission to Sedna, which is pretty far away, would require like some kind of direct fusion drive or a um, solar sail. Uh, with some kind of, you know, close maneuver past the sun. So, you know, there's a lot of targets that are out deep in the solar system that are worth going to and would challenge our current ability to send missions out that far. And we should do them because doing difficult things is worth doing because it makes us better. It makes us more advanced, more capable. 
better able to deal with the rest of the universe. So I think we should be preparing for a mission to Planet Nine right now, and then we just send it to Uranus or Neptune or Sedna if our plans change or if it, we fail to find it. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus, and this week's bonus question is about how many planets we'd have if we included Pluto. I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who put your questions into the YouTube comments as well as everybody who joined me for the live show that we recorded last week. Uh, now we are on our summer hiatus, so I'm not going to promote a new live show, but there are a lot of other live events that we're going to be doing this summer. So stay tuned for that. Now, speaking of things to do this summer, I'm going to give you some recommendations for how you can appreciate the night sky this summer. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bailey Grooving, Brian Bodie, Caredwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Sai Nelson, David Gilton, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Modzo, Paul Robach, Rank Haidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Vlad Shibblin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So it's summertime for the Northern Hemisphere, which means warmer weather, and that means that you can get out and appreciate the night sky without freezing to death. And so I would like to recommend a few activities that you should do. Now, some of these are going to require some planning, and some of these are going to require that you have to be a morning person briefly. But for the planning, there are a couple of meteor showers that are coming up that you should try to organize to appreciate. Some of my fondest memories as a child child was going and watching meteor showers with my family. And if you live in dark skies, then it's no problem. But if you live in light polluted areas, you're going to need to do some organization, some planning to be able to take advantage of it. You have to get to dark skies. But once you do, then there's nothing else you have to do. You just lay outside on a blanket, look up at the sky and enjoy meteor showers. Now, there's two meteor showers you're going to want to keep an eye on. The first is called the Delta Aquarids, and they peak around the end of July, July 29th, July 30th. So they only get about 30 meteors per hour. But if that's the, you know, if that works for your schedule, that's the one you're gonna have to watch. The better one are the Perseids. And these are the classic summer meteor shower, and they peak on August the 12th. And you can get about 100 meteors an hour, which is great. And you can get faint ones and you can get very bright ones. And it's a meteor shower that I watch every single year. I used to watch them with my kids. I have all these fond memories of hanging out, watching the sky, everyone falling asleep to the Perseid meteors. And then later on in August, many of the planets will be visible in the pre-dawn sky. And so if you get up before the sun comes up, or maybe you're like still out because you were watching the meteors the night before, then you'll get a chance to see a whole bunch of the planets just with your eyes. You'll be able to see Mercury, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn all at the same time in the sky. And, you know, if you've never seen Mercury, uh, you're going to want to find a place with a good view uh, to the east so that you can watch it uh, before the sun comes up. All right. Uh, well, so next episode, I'm going to give you some recommendations on some gear that you might want to get to appreciate this better. All right. We'll see you next time.